Marchintosh. Hello. Happy Marchintosh 2022. This is Eric from Eric's Edge, bringing you the first module for the HyperCard Authoring and Programming course. Let's get started. Browsing Basics. If you've opened HyperCard and clicked on an icon or navigated around a stack, you've already done browsing. So this is how a lot of users use HyperCard. They don't do any programming. They just use the stack like an application. We're going to go over the basics of browsing. It'll help us understand how to do uh, better programming for HyperCard stacks. And I just wanted to remind you that if you needed inspiration or wanted to just troll around a bunch of apps, archive.org has over 3,000 HyperCard stacks out there you can try. You can try them out online. You don't even have to download them. So one of the things that's built into HyperCard is a very good tutorial called Your Tour of HyperCard. And I suggest that you actually go look at it. It's quite an awesome little uh, tutorial. Uh, explains a lot about how the, uh, the internals of HyperCard works from a user's perspective. Uh, I thought we'd just go ahead and go there and take a quick look at it. So one, I've set up a icon, a button here, that we can press that'll take and launch the, uh, the tour. Um, but I wanted to point out that if you do leave a stack and want to come back, you can use the Apple plus tilde key combination, or you know, it's also known as the command and tilde key combination to come back to where you left. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to click my button, and here you go, your tour of HyperCard. So you'll see here it says click to begin. You can click anywhere on the card. goes through a, an explanation of HyperCard, and uh, it's broken up into multiple sections. It goes through and it, it shows you using animation, and this is a HyperCard stack, how HyperCard is arranged, what you can use it for, um, how stacks are put together. I highly recommend it. We're going to go over some of this in the course anyway because you need to know it from a, uh, a certain perspective. And there are certain things that need to be highlighted and are important. But you'll get all of that by going through this tutorial. So I highly recommend you do that. Yeah, I'm just going to click through some of it here give you an idea of some of the uh, visual effects that you can do on HyperCard. They're pretty cool. And we'll get to that eventually in the programming. You know, here's an example of clickable content. One of the things that uh, we'll talk about later, uh, mystery meat navigation is something you have to watch for. So how does someone know that they need to click on one of these to do something? You might have to explain it in your help. HyperCard stacks can also do sound. You know, and it goes into how to use the, uh, the message bar to find things. Again, we'll go in that in detail. Anyway, it's a very nice stack, so let's go back. So that was a tour of HyperCard. Um, the command plus tilde takes you back a card. It doesn't take you, if you navigate through, I'd have to hit back multiple times to have gotten back here, so. Okay, so after you've taken a look at the tour, let's talk about the home stack. You know, the home stack is a special uh, HyperCard stack that contains things, configuration things for, um, you know, setting up file paths for searching um, and uh, what type of uh, user access level your stacks have, things like that. It's, it's a very special stack, and I've got a link to it here. So when it first starts up out of the box, it's got the HyperCard Tour that we've already discussed. Um, it has HyperCard Help and uh, talks about new features in this version of HyperCard. It's got some art pieces that you can use in your stacks. 
there's uh, an application called addresses anyway uh, you could even use it to dial an analog phone obviously that's got little utility today you can use the QuickTime tools in your stacks um, this is kind of a cool thing called graph maker and it's an example of creating graphs using the paint tools and programming I used it in my uh, Wordle game to show the uh, the guess statistics and you can uh, get to the Wordle game on archive.org I've got a link up here in the corner that you can click and it'll take you right there there's some other things that are in the stack it's got buttons that you can copy and paste that already do things for you help about how to do audio um, hypercard stacks can actually do color I've never used it but when we get to that section of the tutorial uh, we'll all learn how to do that uh, there's a reference for the HyperTalk language. That's the programming language that's used in HyperCard. Um, you can also use AppleScript. And then it gives you a couple of places to, to do some cards. This is something I'm working on that'll be part of the course. You may remember Nico. Uh, I believe it's pronounced Nico. I can't speak Japanese. Anyway, um, and it was a, uh, I think it first showed up in Unix. It's a, it's a uh, screen uh, little tool where you've got a cat that will chase your mouse around. And so I'm doing this as an animation example for the course. And if you click, click on the cat, he kind of chases the, uh, the mouse around. Um, still need to work on the code a little bit. Um, but these cards are here so that you could add links to other stacks, things like that. So it's kind of prepared to be your home for your development. Now, one of the first things you need to do is set the user preferences. There's five different levels in HyperCard. So let's say you wanted to uh, allow somebody to use your stack, but all, all they could do is browse through it and type into it. They wouldn't be able to do anything else. You can set the user level for it. You know, we're going to leave everything at the scripting level. There, that way there's no need to go back and change it later. Let's take a quick look at those user preferences. So here, uh, you can put your name in here. It doesn't really do anything. But we're at the level 5, which is the scripting level. And that lets you edit the cards. You can delete cards. You can create stacks. Um, there's a couple of other settings here. Um, I've never bothered to use them. I suppose we'll learn about them at some point. Authoring. Authoring is a level where you can create cards and add buttons and things to them, but you're not doing any programming. Level three is painting, and this is where you can draw and do the different things on backgrounds and cards. Typing. So all you can do is maybe have an address stack that you want to keep uh, track of your addresses. And then browsing. All you can do is look through the cards. You're not going to make any changes to them. So let's go back. Now that's a case of I used the command tilde to move back. All right. The other thing is the file uh, path preferences. And this allows HyperCard to know where to search and look for things. So let's take a quick look at that. If you've installed HyperCard the way it was meant to be installed and you haven't moved things around, you don't need to touch this. You know, there is locations for the various stacks, like uh, your tour of HyperCard is actually a separate stack. It's not part of the home stack. So it needs to know where to find it. Um, and there's, you know, the naming convention for file paths for um, the Macintosh uses a colon to start it out and as a separator between the different folders. You can also indicate the first one can be the drive or the, the hard drive that you've got and then the folders underneath that. So. If it doesn't have uh, the hard drive identified, it assumes whatever the current drive is. So that's for stacks. 
there are applications that you can set up paths for and this is where the apple script utilities are and then documents and um, that's it um, i suggest just leaving this alone install hypercard using the default uh, folder structure and everything you won't have to worry about it so we're going to go back If you, if you want to know more about path names and how they work um, on a Macintosh, there's plenty of references out there. Okay, the next thing that we're going to cover is saving stacks. Now, HyperCard automatically saves your stack as you're using it. If you want to, you can also save a copy of your stack. Let's say you're doing some programming development. You've gotten to a nice place where everything's working the way you want it. Make a copy of your stack. I can't emphasize this enough. If you're doing work and you don't make a copy, eventually you're going to paint yourself into a corner somewhere and want to move back to a prior version. So I just go ahead and make copies all the time. So when you make a copy, let's go ahead and do this. Under File, Save a Copy. The dialog box that pops up automatically puts a copy on the end of your stack name because you're making a copy. There is also a file type uh, drop down. Stack is the default and that's what you're going to want to leave it at. Later we'll learn how to make an application stack and what you're doing there is creating a standalone stack that you can click on and open without having HyperCard installed. And then there's more advanced things you can do related to setting up a file type and we'll go into this later uh, each Macintosh program has its own creator code and you can set the file type and you can do versioning so this is more of a programmer kind of a thing but we'll get there eventually just use stack for now when you make copies okay hypercard stacks are made up of cards so each card is what you're looking at this is a this is a card right here what you're what you're looking at is a card in a stack of multiple cards um, you know cards can contain can contain text and graphics you can put different content on each card uh, you can think of it in the analogy they used to use is a rolodex I don't know how many of you guys know what a Rolodex is. It's not used very often anymore. Or a um, card index file at a library. You know, they used to have these long drawers with all these cards in it, and you could look up books that way. Yeah, yeah, that, that went away a long time ago. Anyway, a modern analogy would be your phone contact list on your smartphone. You know, it's got separate pages for each contact, with different fields on it in different information it might have a picture of the contact and you could flip through those kind of like a set of cards okay you know it's not restricted to one piece of information so you could have a card that's got your contact information on it and a card the next card would have somebody else's contact information same format and everything different information backgrounds Cards are made up of a background layer and then the front-facing card layer. There's actually more logical layers in between, but we'll get to that later. Each, each card has a background. Well, that background is normally shared amongst multiple cards. So you could think of, if you have an address card, it would have the name, the address, might have a phone number field, all of that could be created on the background. And when you create a new card, you inherit and get everything in that background with the new card. You only have to design it once and put it in background layer. You could also put an image, uh, for example. Let's, the command B gets you into the background mode and you'll notice that I've got two buttons here and the image that appears on every card is in the background. Command B. 
and you move back to the card layer and normal use. So if I went back to the background here, grabbed the pencil tool and wrote on my card, now let's do it someplace we can see it. Ah, so you can see it shows up. Now if I go to the next card, let's let's go to the actually change back to the hand tool. You'll see that the card before that card shares the same background, so it appears here. All right. I'm going to clean up my mess now. So go back into B, get the eraser tool. Right, let's do the select tool. You'll see that it has the same paint tools that you get in Mech Paint. That's nice because they all behave and work the same way. Cut picture. So I just clean that up. Card looks good. Go back. Change back to the pointer tool. Now we're back to where we were. So this this will give you a visual representation of it. You've got the card layer and the background layer. And in this example, the background layer has some images on it or an outline for something so it can appear on each card. Fields contain text information. You can place them on a card and you could also place them on the background. Each card can have one or more fields on it. Uh, you can think of it as like a post-it note or something where you would fill in information on the card. You know, going back to our our contact list, you could have a field for first name, a field for last name, a field for the description, something like that. If you look at this card, I've got a couple of fields on here, and uh, the highlighted or shaded uh, icon here on the tools palette is the field tool. So when you use that, it exposes the fields on your card. And you can see we've got two of them here. There's one for the the title or the uh, you know, and one for the details. If we double click on that using the tool, you can see some of the attributes for a field. There's a title. Mine's called title or field name. Uh, you can set different styles for it. You can make it transparent like mine, so it just shows the text. Opaque, rectangle, shadow. You could do scrolling fields, so you could actually have more content than you can see on the screen. There are text styles, so you can set the default text style for, for the field. You can also select text when you're browsing and use the style and the font drop downs to change the selected text to a different uh, style so it doesn't have to be the same style on the uh, card um, oops. and we'll cover scripts later that's where you store programming that's specific to this field so it's a kind of an object oriented metaphor um, you can lock the text and what that does, if you go back to browsing, so we go back to the tools, go back to browsing, you notice that here I've got cursor changes so I can select and edit the field, but this one doesn't show anything. I just get the, uh, the hand cursor over it because it's locked and you can't do anything with the field. buttons. One of the other objects that you can put on a card and a background are buttons. Buttons are for clicking. You click on it and you take some action that's programmed into that button to do something. Buttons can take many forms. It could look like a traditional uh, rounded, rounded edged button that you would see in a dialog box. 
They could be squares. There's different uh, styles for them. You could have transparent background, just like uh, we did with the uh, field. You could even do an invisible button that you could overlay. Perhaps you've got a graphic and it's a, too big to be an icon or something. So you want to have a clickable region on your screen. You could do that as well. Poorly designed stacks suffer from mystery meat navigation. And this is something that came about during the 90s in the, uh, the WWW bubble when everybody was uh, doing crazy designs for web pages, things like that. Well, what it refers to is navigation that's not visible to the user until you hover over that section. It's a poor design. It confuses users, makes it difficult for them to do things. So you want to make sure that you don't do a lot of, unless it's part of a game or something, maybe there's a reason to do it. Uh, find Waldo, I don't know. But there is something you can do. If you're not sure where the buttons are on a card, you can hold down the command and the option keys and it'll actually highlight the buttons. You can see I've only got two, so there's no mystery buttons on here. Let's go ahead and create a button so you collect you select the button tool and you notice that it did outline our existing buttons and we're gonna say new button so here's the you know traditional rounded button and I'm gonna make it big I'm gonna go into the properties I'm gonna change it to transparent and then uh, I'm really getting ahead of ourselves here but I'm gonna go into the script and I'm going to have it do something and put hello in message box. I'm not even sure if this is going to work. I don't usually use the message box, but let's give it a try and see what happens. So I'm going to stick this here. Now, one of the other idiosyncrasies, the name also appears. Um, in the button. So let's remove the name. We're not going to show the name. Okay, now I've got this this button that actually sits over the title. So now I've made it a clickable thing. Go back to the tools. Can't understand the arguments of put. Okay, so I didn't do the, the thing correctly. We're not going to worry about it. But you notice that's a mystery area. There's no visual indication that there's a button there. That's what I mean by mystery neat navigation. So we're, oh yeah, let's see if we can see it. Command and option. Ah, it's highlighted so I can tell it's there. Tools, go back to the button tool. Here's our button. I deleted it because I really don't want it there. All right. The message box. You saw me try to use it programmatically there and I failed. But the message box is your primary means of communication between you and your HyperCard stack. Uh, if the message box isn't showing, you can go to the Go menu and click on Message and it'll display it. So it's here on the bottom of the screen. Um, there's other ways you can do it, but you know that's, that's one of the uh, most common ones. There's a, a bunch of commands in HyperTalk that you can execute inside a message box. Um, so let's, uh, let's do one of them here. Go to home. Now home is the name of the stack. Let's see what it does. You hit the return key. It brought up the home stack. Takes you to the first card of it. So there, there are multiple messages in HyperTalk that you could use the message box for. Let's try one of them here. Put hello world, it's a common first program thing, into message. It stuck hello world into the message box. Not very exciting but you'll, you'll find that you use it for various things. I don't use it a lot myself in stacks programmatically. You could use it to show messages to a user. 
right. uh, Command M to hide it. The Go menu. You know, we've used this a couple of times to do some things, but there's multiple ways to navigate your stack. So I've got buttons. That's one way of doing it. I've programmed these buttons to go from the previous card or to go to the next card. Um, you can use the Go menu to go back, to go to the home stack. Um, recent something we'll cover next. Um, you can go to the first, the previous, the next, and the last card in your stack. Uh, you can also use the arrow keys on your keyboard. Uh, the um, left arrow key takes you back. The right arrow key takes you to next. If you, if you hold the command key down and push the arrow, you go to the last card or the first card. So let's go back. And back remembers what you're going through so that you can go back to the stack you were at without having to do previous or next over and over again. Anyway, recent. Recent is kind of a neat tool. HyperCard keeps track of the last 42 cards that you visited. And if you use the recent feature, which you can get to from the Go menu, recent it actually displays little tiny images that are usually enough to figure out and and see what what the card has on it and you can use that to navigate to a specific card so let's go to the first card all you got to do is click on it, it takes you right there and you can also hit command R to bring it up All right, back to recent again. The navigator palette. Now this is something that's a little more useful. Let's say you've got a stack that doesn't have built-in navigation buttons. You're getting tired of using the command one, two, three, and four to move around. Well, there is a navigation palette. The only way to get to the navigator palette is to use the message box and type nav in it, and it pops up this palette and now you've got a little tool you can use to navigate your stack. You can go go to previous, you can go to the home card, you can go to help, you can bring up recent cards. You can go to the first, previous, next, last, you can use the find functionality, which we'll talk about. You can hide and show the message box. And this will switch between card stacks that are open if you have multiples open. So that's kind of nice. The scroll window. This is something I really don't use. I design my stack so that they'll work on a classic Mac. But you can have a stack that is tiny as 64 by 64 or as large as 1280 by 1280. So let's say you're working on a 1280 by 1280 stack and you've got a smaller monitor that you're you know, forced to use for some reason. Well, how do you navigate around that card? Well, you can use the scroll window to do it. So if you use Command E, it'll open the scroll window. And with a scroll window, you can do things like drag and change the size of the screen. So that you can uh, work on it on a smaller monitor. All right. You can drag around the smaller screen so that you can... It's kind of like doing uh, one of those tools where you expand your desktop. If you, if you double click, it'll just take it back to where it was at. So I guess that could be a useful tool. So a hypercard is very much a information tool, heavily reliant on text, and you know a lot of apps are heavily reliant on text, things like that. Traditionally, much of the work you do in hypercard stacks involves finding 
in entering data. We're going to cover uh, text search techniques, how to create and delete cards, how to edit text information in cards, things like that. So it's kind of the basic user interactions with cards uh, above and beyond browsing. Like most development environments, there's many ways that you can find information and enter information. Before creating our own stacks, we're going to take a look at the best practices, ways to make the work easier for users to understand. So we've been doing this all along here. This little icon that you see that looks like a finger pointing, that's the browse tool. Um, and it's highlighted here on the screen. Uh, the browse tool is used to interact with stacks. It's the way that you navigate and click on a button to do anything. Um, when you're searching, you'll always be using the browse tool. And if for some reason you find that you, you, you know, maybe you started a stack that that has a bug in it or something where it is stuck on the paint tool or something, you just go up to the tools menu and select the browse tool and it'll take you back to using the hand. If you're over a text field that's not locked like I am here, you're going to get the insertion tool for text editing. But if you're off of that, you'll you'll get the, the hand browser tool. And, you know, there's various ways that you can search your hypercard stack for information. The easiest way is you just look through the cards. You know, you use the navigation buttons, use the go menu and the tools there, and just kind of scroll through your, your cards in your stack until you find what you want. Not the most efficient way to do it, but... You know, if you don't have a huge stack, it might be the best way. But there are tools for finding text. And HyperCard has a pretty good search capability, and there's various ways you can do it. You can use the find command on the uh, message box to actually search for stuff. Let's find button. So it's going to look through the stack. It's going to find ins each instance of button. It'll find words that start with button. So, and then it'll highlight that. And you can see that here. Button has actually got a little box around it. If you hit return again, it'll find the next instance of button. You notice it found the word buttons here because it looked for, a, you know, it started with button. You keep going. All right. Now, if you change it, let's change it to, oh, uh, C-H-A-S. So you can see we've got two actual search things in here. We hit enter. Okay. You'll notice it found the word change. It's looking for words that start with either CH or AS. So if we hit enter, there's changeling, or changing, chars. Change, anyway. Now, HyperCard will search faster if you've got at least three characters in your search criteria. So if we change this, to CHA. It actually is more optimal and it will do a better job of finding things if you have at least three characters. If you're just doing a single character, it takes a little longer. You can't really notice it here. Okay, so let's go back. Okay. You can also use the Go menu, Find. And what it does is it opens the message box, puts in the Find command, double quotes, and then highlights your last search that you were looking for. So you can simply type whatever it is you want to search for. 
hit return. Now you're going to find the next thing. Obviously, it's not case sensitive. Okay. Now, there's other find uh, commands, and the other one is find chars. The find command just looked for anything that's a word that started with it. The find chars command will find every instance containing the find string, so not just the beginning of a name. Okay, so here you can see where it found the letters within a word instead of the start of the word. Find string. Okay. Find string works the same way as find chars, but with one exception. It'll actually execute the hypercard's fast search if you have at least three characters. And find word. Now we're getting to something a little more useful. If you want to look for complete words. So let's say. Find word, arch, didn't find it, because I don't have arch anywhere, word, search, okay, that's at least one instance of search, there's another, I've got it here, Let's see if I've got something that's part of a word. How about hyper? It's part of hyper card. H Y P E R. Didn't find it because I don't have just the word hyper. Okay, so that ends our uh, module on uh, browsing and typing. Next, we will uh, get into printing and uh, linking. And after that, we'll start the module that covers authoring. So we'll get more into building cards and doing the non-programming authoring that, uh, that you can do in HyperCard. This is Eric from Eric's Edge, signing off. Have a great day, and I'll see you on the next module. Fluff up those beards, because it's time for another episode. No. No, I can't do it. Nope. Not gonna happen. Nope. Bad idea. Never mind. <laughs>